Hey, Browns fans, welcome on in to another episode of The Dog Check. With yours truly, Spencer German, Eric Metcalf, obviously alongside. Boy, do we have a lot to talk about after that awful, awful loss to the New York Giants. We will get into all those things, but I, I honestly think a, a good place to start after this one because the Browns lost more than the game on Sunday. Uh, some injury notes that are kind of looming large this week for the team. The big one that is going to have sort of a longer-term impact, it seems like, is why Teller who's dealing with an MCL sprain. He's expected to miss several weeks. And Kevin Stefanski said in his Monday press conference that that also could result in him potentially ending up on the IR. So kind of taking a wait-and-see approach there. We'll see how that plays out. But not a good not a good sign for the Browns, especially along an offensive line that's already had its fair share of issues, something Eric and I will talk about here coming up. The other big one is Miles Garrett, who is day-to-day – which is honestly like I, I contemplated whether or not it was good news or bad news with him because I think it's good news that he's only day to day because it's it, given how he talked after the game, it seemed like it could have been a lot worse. But it's also one of these things that clearly is going to bother him the whole season. And I'm starting to wonder if, if at some point he is going to miss time. So that's something we'll get into as well. Other injuries, Jedrick Wills, who left the game, James Hudson, who left the game. No, uh, it's still some un- uncertainty on what their status looks like. Kevin Stefanski will know more later in the week, he said. And then David Njoku, who we know is dealing with that ankle injury, expected potentially back this week. Kevin Stefanski said we'll see in regards to him playing against the Raiders in week four. So those are kind of the overarching things that loom large for the Browns this week. We have a ton to talk about. But before we do, I do want to remind you guys that Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football bet online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games. Think you know your stuff? Get on the 200,000 mega contest to pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly a weekly prize and share of the $200,000. When the game's over, head on over to Online Casino and get in on games of blackjack or poker or unwind with over 150 slot games as well. Head to the website today and get in on the action. Bet online. The game starts here. And I can safely say that the Dog Check podcast really starts getting going here as uh, Eric Metcalf obviously joins the conversation. Eric, first, let's start on a, on a good note. You were back in town this weekend. You got the chance to celebrate as part of the, the sort of Browns Alumni Day. Just uh, how did it feel to be back in Cleveland and, and celebrate with some of your your your, your fellow Cleveland Browns legends. So you were able to find a good note in this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, it was I, I, Eric, it was you. It was, it, was, it, was you it was you being back in town and it was Amari Cooper having a good game. Those are the two. Those are the two. And, and, <laughs> no, and don't forget Phil Dawson going into the legends. Yeah, that too. That, 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 too. that was the big thing for the weekend. And so, you know, uh, getting to come around all the – former alumni, the, the legends, and, and bringing uh, Phil into the family as, as a legend was great because, you know, especially because he's a Longhorn also. And so, <laughs> and so, and so I, I appreciate that he got his opportunity because he did great things as a, as a Browns kicker. Even when the, the times were, were, were dim, he was still kicking balls in, in the stadium and making it against the wind and in the snow. And so he did a lot of good things for this team. So I'm proud of Phil and, and happy that he's a legend as well. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll stay there for a second because Phil, um, you know, it's, it's funny, like, no, there's not a lot of franchises that look around and can be like, man, like, there was an era of time where, like, our best players were a, a, a tackle and a kicker. But that's what it was in Cleveland for a long stretch of time when you had Joe Thomas and Phil Dawson on this team because there wasn't a, necessarily a lot of good going on in the field. But those two guys became, like, just staples and figureheads of the franchise guys that fans know and love. And yeah, I, I agree. Like seeing Phil go in this weekend was awesome. I thought his speech was great. I love the fact that he still feels so connected to the Cleveland community. And he clearly loved his time here and still looks back so fondly on, on this city and this fan base. And we like to call it like get gets Cleveland guys is what we like to call it. He's a totally a gets Cleveland guy. Like the fan base loves him and, and he definitely leans into to uh, appreciating them as much as he as as much as they appreciate him. Yeah, and he he understands the fact that he did his job when he was here. Yeah, and, and that's why fans really appreciate him, regardless of what the record was during his time here. He when he was called upon to go out there and make some field goals, sometimes in clutch games to win them, he did that, and that's what fans in, in Cleveland always love their 
they're loving fans. They're they're good and bad at times, but you know, <laughs> it was one of those guys that he didn't have to worry about them not liking him because he did. Uh, he he brought his hard hat and he went out there every week and did what he was supposed to do. Well, let's face it, like. Cleveland's been a tough place to kick for a long time. Now, I, he kind of took a jab at, at – uh, up until Dustin Hopkins, there really wasn't a lot of stability at that position after Phil. And he sort of took a jab at, at Dustin and said, like, they've closed in the corners of the stadium a little bit since since I had to kick there. So you have a little bit of an easier time than I do. I thought that was funny. Yeah. Um, but, but, I mean, Cleveland's not an easy place to kick still. Um, but Phil was doing it, you know, where the wind was really blowing through that thing. And I think that's another part of his story for sure, too, is that how good he was given the conditions he had to kick in. And, yeah, and it was changed since the time we were there when Matt Barr and those guys were kicking also. And so, <laughs> and so it got a little better. That's just how things happen, you know. It's all relative. The stadiums get better. The footing gets better. The, the, uh, the air, the atmosphere gets better. So you just have to be able to take advantage of it and do your job when you're called upon. Yeah, no, I feel, Phil's an awesome story. It was good to see him get inducted. I'm glad that you got to make it back into town. The only thing I regret is I, I didn't get a chance to, to catch you. I was upstairs in the press box. I know you you were doing your own thing. I did run into Pat, who we obviously had on the show last week. It was nice to finally meet him in person. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure at some point down the road, Eric, we'll get a chance to to, to meet each other in person. So. <laughs> you know, Pat, I was thinking about Pat, and I was like, he nailed it on the head. If you get in situations – where all they have to do is rush the quarterback, they're very good. And they proved that. Yeah. <laughs> they proved yeah. that. We didn't run the ball. I mean, we were down uh, Conklin to start. Then we get three three offensive linemen hurt during the course of the game. And yet we still throw the ball over 40 times. Yeah. yeah. So um, that put the defensive line for the Giants in a pin their ears back situation. And that's what they did. Well, that's a perfect segue because I know we filibustered long enough to try to avoid sort of this elephant in the room, if you will. Um, But, yeah, I mean, listen, that game did not go the way anybody planned. And I'm going to be honest, Eric, like to me, the thing that that stands out the most as a concern with this team is the fact that I just don't know, like offensively specifically, I don't know what their identity is. And and, and I understand like – you know, Stefanski, I, I, week one, there wasn't a lot of motion, and that was something that was supposed to be the staple of um, Ken Dorsey's offense. And we saw a ton of it during training camp. Like, they were doing a lot of different motion stuff. They'd have two tight ends and motion them to the other side of the formation. They would move receivers all around. And so week one, they didn't do as much of that. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like, they showcased this, and they didn't use it. Week two, I thought they got back to it, and it was like, okay. And then I thought they did some of it this weekend as well. But it's like, like I understand week to week you're game planning different things, you're doing things differently. But I just have a hard time putting my finger on like, okay, what is the thing that they do well? What is the thing that they're trying to accomplish on any given play or any given series? I just don't see any sort of consistency. And that's the thing that I think is the most concerning because three weeks in now, we talk about the first couple of games being an extension of the preseason. By now, going into week four, you should have an idea of what you're trying to kind of do and, and do well so that you can keep just kind of building on that thing while also changing some things up week to week, and, and you kind of build momentum and keep going from here. And while you say that, that very statement you made is a, a question I have had, or question you've had, a question I've had for the last few years. Because we've had Nick Chubb, who's been one of the best rushers in the league, but we, were, we still weren't identified as a team that is going to run the ball. Yeah. Like you, you play the Ravens or you play Tennessee Titans when, when Derrick Henry was there. They're, when you, you they step off the bus, you say they're going to run the ball. Even when we had Nick Chubb, we still didn't know if we were going to run the ball. We just did from time to time, threw the ball. One day we might throw it 40 times. The next game we might throw it 20 and hand it off 40 times. That, so, like you said, the identity. We just don't know who we are right now and how we're going to win. I mean, if you want Deshaun to be the guy, you got to protect him. First and foremost, you got yeah. to run plays that are going to protect him. You can't you can't have slow developing plays when when guys are rushing like that on, especially with four down, with four off the linemen down. You got to protect them. You just, let's make it quicker, quick hitting plays. It's okay to throw the ball four yards and the guy runs sixty. I've seen it before. It happens. It it can happen as long as we're calling those plays, those quick timing plays that get the ball out quickly. Let them go do things so you don't have to think about things. I, I know we're a big play uh, play action uh, pass team. 
but it does you no good if you're not running the ball. Yeah, yeah. If I mean, you're that, not that, running the ball. How does that help you? That's. I mean, that, that's a. I mean, a, a, a perfect point. Like I, and it's it's crazy too, Eric, because like week two, it seemed like they found some rhythm with the run game where it was like, okay, if they can do this consistently. Look how how everything else sort of functions and flows with that. I understand week two wasn't perfect. And Deshaun, you know, he had moments. He had some bad moments. He had some good moments. The offensive line had some bad moments. They had some good moments. And it was an ugly, ugly win. But you won the game, and the offense looked, you know, worlds better than it did in week one. And I think it really did start with, like, the fact that the run game was effective for them. And then this weekend, we I mean, we talked about it, you and I, uh, on our on the show we did just with each other. Uh, and then we talked about it with Pat. This Giants run defense is not very good. And the way that you could beat them was run the football. And it didn't seem like there was like a, there was necessarily an, an, a, a push to do that consistently. They, they moved on from it too quickly. And it was almost like they thought they – that they were, it almost felt like they were playing a game that they were down like 30. And it was like, well, now we have to throw the ball. Because I don't know – like you were only down two scores. And then you made it a one-score game in, early in the fourth quarter – and it was still like, okay, where's the run game? And they were still just kind of throwing it a lot and getting Deshaun Watson really beat up and taking all these hits. And so that didn't help matters either. Like, I, it's, it, and again, Nick Chubb's coming back at some point. He's got at least one more week he has to miss on the pup list. Does that change things when he gets back? Like, is that, is that finally going to be when they lean on the run game more? I don't know. But to this point, like, I, I, I have to say no, probably not, because they've clearly said they want to throw the ball more but it doesn't seem like that is advantageous to them having success as an offense. Right. And, and I understand that Deshaun didn't play in preseason. I understand that uh, Amari had been struggling throughout the course of the first two games, but it's not about going up there and forcing them into having good games. It's about doing it organically, you know, within the confines of what you're yeah. calling. And I, I think they got into a situation where they just wanted to force it into Deshaun having a good game and Amari having a good game. And so that keeps you away from the run. And it, and it makes it hard for you to get back to, to the run, especially when you got these guys who are, are not on their heels. They're trying to rush the passer every play and making it tough. And so if you got Deshaun – faking like he's going to hand off when a team knows you're not running the ball, they just keep running. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's what, and that's what made it difficult for those linemen uh, to, to block the, the, the edges is that yeah. the, the defensive end just took off running, knowing that they weren't going to run the ball. And so you put them at, in, in, a, in, in a bad position along with the plays that we were calling, I think. Yeah, it's well said. They, they ran the ball a, a grand total of 18 times in that game, which is just inexcusable, uh, especially for an offense that, like we said, is going to get Nick Chubb back at some point. Um, and I, and and like like along all the lines of this conversation, Eric, like if, if the point of this season is just going to be, well, we got to prove that we were right about Deshaun and we got to make this thing about him, so we're just going to throw it a gazillion times, like that's 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 not advantageous to this team winning. Like you got to do what's going to work for you within this this team and within this offense. And I think the run game has to be a part of that. So yeah, like all of this is, is concerning here to start the season. I, let's stay on Deshaun for a second, because I know it's the low hanging fruit to just point and say like, Hey, this game's on him. It's his fault, blah, blah, blah. I think there was moment like there was things that didn't look good from his standpoint. Like I, I still think some of these plays, the way they develop, he's not seeing things great. And that was a problem in week one as well. Um, and a little bit in week two, um, but, and, and I do think I, the one thing I will put on him is I think the handoff to Jerome Ford that, that resulted in a fumble. I think that was on him just based off of like what I know about those, you know, when you're handing the ball off where the ball's supposed to be. I mean, it hits off of Ford's like shoulder pads. It, it was, it was too high in my opinion. Um, and maybe we learn at some point that it wasn't his fault, but that, that was just my perspective on it. But I, I have a hard time, like, other than a few things here or there sitting here and being like, well, this loss is on Deshaun. I know that's what people want to do because we want answers to whether or not he's the guy or he's not the guy. But I can't do that because when he's running for his life for the entire game, gets hit 17 times, sacked eight. I mean, I get why he was seeing ghosts a little bit, maybe rushing throws and doing some other things because he was he was getting hit all day. So I, I think it's – this one's – it's it's another loss that's on everybody. But I do think, like, the offensive line is probably the biggest problem with this team right now. And, and unfortunately, it's, I think this right now is where we we miss Bill Callahan the most. 
right? Yeah. When, and I'm not saying the coach isn't good right now. It's just the way that Bill Callahan had those guys messing together, even when guys were going down. So it's, it's, he's one of the greatest to ever do it. And so it seems like we're missing him, especially when guys are going down, right? And, and, and going back to Deshaun, I think, like you said, that nobody wants to stand back there and get hit. So even though it might not be, everything for him seems like it's coming a little faster, right? And so if you're having these slow developing plays where you're trying to, like I said, play action pass, get back five to seven steps, that takes time. And so it's going to, and, and so things are now clicking, turning the guy's head a lot faster. So you might not see things that we think are open, but at the speed he sees it, it might not be. And at the, and then he doesn't want to make a mistake and throw an interception. So he's got all these different things going through his head. And while people think all he had to do was throw it to this guy, it was open. He was open. It's not that simple. I mean, I watch, I watch a lot of running backs and I say, Guys could have had why when I'm watching on TV, why didn't he just go here? Why didn't he go go there? And and I played the position. So I yeah. know how to do it. But at the same time, what I see at that speed isn't the same thing that the other guy sees. Yeah. And so and so it makes it hard for, for these guys because the Sean, I, I he he showed flashes of who he can be. I think it's a matter of getting him comfortable, which he's still in his preseason because <laughs> he didn't play in preseason. Yeah. So getting him comfortable and, and getting everybody comfortable with what we're trying to do goes back to who are we? Where's the identity? What are we trying to do? And like you said, from game to game, it changes based on what the defense is yeah. giving you. But you still have to be, this is who we are. You stop it. If you do, we adjust. That's what Bill Walsh did. Got him yeah. Super Bowl. Yeah, and then that, that, it's it's harder for him to get comfortable when the offensive line is playing as poorly as they are. Um, it, you know, it's it's kind of a compounding thing here. It's, it's a domino effect of things. Like Deshaun didn't play in the preseason, and he's trying to kind of get comfortable, and he's maybe not seeing things as fast as he used to when as routes are developing. But then on top of that, the offensive line isn't blocking very well for him and protecting him. So then he feels like he has to speed up his clock even more, and then he's taking off and he's missing open guys and. So it's a, it's a compounding thing that I think has sort of multiple answers. I think some of it is on Deshaun. I think a lot of it is on the offensive line. And, again, I, I just think the offensive line is is the biggest issue right now. And, Eric, that's compounded as well by the fact that now you don't know what the status – it sounds like Wyatt Teller's missing a couple weeks. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with Jedrick Wills. And I, I thought, like, I understand there's still a lot of questions about Jed Wills as much as there's questions about Deshaun. But – I felt like his return was supposed to be something that was like, okay, he can get his feet underneath him against a team like the Giants that you should be able to beat because you on paper you're the better team. And it went the complete opposite way. And he looked he looked like he was lost out there. I mean, it was bad. Um, is is the offensive line uh, from your perspective the thing that you're most worried about with this team moving forward? I am right now because they keep getting injured. And and yeah. and the and the fact that the play calling hasn't allowed them to be who they really are and that's a big physical offensive line right yeah. I, we we said when we spoke in the, in the show last week and when we spoke with pat that if the browns go in there and get physical at the line of scrimmage running the ball the chances of them winning are great and they haven't done that in any of the games i mean granted they've ran run the ball some and against jacksonville they ran the ball more than they did against the cowboys but they weren't going in there and being physical. The Giants were just more uh, more physical than they were at the at the point of, of, of an impact, and so that's I, that's why I think we got to get back to that. E- even if you're getting two yards on the run, we just have to get to like, okay, we're going to be a physical running team. That's when the play action works. Yeah, um, it's it's well said, and we have a bunch of stuff to still get into. We'll talk about the the fourth down call from Kevin Stefanski. We'll talk about the defense a little bit here. But before I do, I need to talk to you guys about what I consider the most important part of an outfit. It's your hat. I'm a big hat guy. I wear them sometimes on the show. I'm wearing one today, and this hat specifically is from me, uh, Melon Hats, excuse me. And most hats, you wear them for a while. They get worn down. There's sweat marks, not melon hats. Melon makes the most premium and durable hat wear in the world. 
whether you're tailgating, working out at the golf course, or heading out on a date, you need Melon. They're built to last five times longer than any other hat, and they have hats for all sorts of weather, as you can check out their Hydro Collection. Good for the summertime, if you're planning on jumping in the pool or taking a vacation to the beach. Uh, when it gets cold, any of our Cleveland fans listening, you guys know winter is coming up. It's just around the corner. It's going to be here before you know it. You're going to want to check out Melon's Thermal Collection as well. For any occasion or circumstance, find the perfect and most durable hat for you with Melon. Go to Melon.com, that's M-E-L-I-N.com, and put it to te- put it to the test for yourself. Uh, again, we appreciate you listening to the Dog Check Podcast, part of the Believe Network of Podcasts, and also Aaron Weekly on Bally Sports Cleveland. Eric, a few more things I want to hit on from this game, and then we'll look ahead very briefly here to the, to the Raiders game coming up in week four, which is a big one. Um, are you under the like? Do you because listen, Miles Garrett, I get it. Like he's trying to play through these this this foot injury and this foot situation. It felt very ominous in his post game press conference when he was talking about like, you know, I'm going to get an MRI on Monday, and you know, I'm not worried about anything until I get told otherwise, and I'm just going to keep trying to play. And then you watch him leave the the media room, and he's getting carted out of the stadium, and we're like, oh boy. And I just kind of look ahead, and it's like, okay, he's considered day to day. We know he's tough. He's going to keep trying to play through this thing. But you look at the schedule, you're like, man, there are 14 games still to go. I just feel like it, it's it's inevitable that at some point he's going to be missing time this year. Yeah, and so so you might as well get ahead of it, right? I, I, I think it's one of those situations. During this little stretch, we thought there was games we were mm-hmm. going to win for sure, but these are the games that we should win. And so if, 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 if he's going to miss time, I would rather it be now to take care of that foot because it seems to me from hearing him in, in interviews that this has been going on since he was a child. Yeah. Right. And if it's been going on that long, he's still been battling through it, through it and becoming the player that he is defensive MVP last year. So if you, I think you just rest him a little bit, maybe in the next week or two and then get him back for the stretch and get him as healthy as you can, because it's still going to hurt him eventually like he's always said it's still gonna hurt so you try to have him as the best player he can be yeah i mean it's a tough thing to figure out because on one hand you don't want to be without miles garrett uh obviously he's one of the best players in this league and he talks about it no, no so nonchalantly i think that's the thing that like throws me off is like he's like yeah you know whatever just i'm always playing through injuries it's not a bit he just acts like it's no big deal but i know cleveland fans are like you know they're very antsy about the idea of not having miles garrett out there on the field um but i i, I understand what you're saying though like Maybe just get out in front of it, and and I get it. Like if you're going to do an MRI and there's nothing that like requires immediate surgery, these guys are going to be like, well, I just want to play. But at some point, like you got to weigh the 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 future of this season, the future of, of for him and what he brings to the table. I, I'm I, I'm sort of hard pressed to to fall in, in line with you and 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 believe that at some point you might just have to sort of shut it down and say, let's see if we can. And 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 this probably is the time to do it. To your point. But it's a tough call because you don't want to be without Miles Garrett. But, yeah, like, these things aren't going away. And that was something he talked about after the game. Like, because of the foot injury, now he's got an issue, like another a lower ankle issue. Like, it's like they're, it's all kind of compounding on itself. And nothing can heal because he doesn't have time to heal. And the bye isn't coming until early November. Right. And, and, and it's crazy because when I was in Cleveland, a friend of mine said to me, where was Miles Garrett today? And I'm like, he's hurt. He's hurt. But he's out there. And so for me as a player and as, a, as an organization, if I see if people are saying or thinking that he's not even out there, even though he is out there, you might as well take this time to get him as healthy as you can. Right. And because I because we know he he wants to be out there. Yeah. You got to protect players from their, themselves. He wants to be out there. He wants to go out there and contribute. But at the same time, if he can't be himself, he how much is he really hurting the team? I mean, helping the team. Yeah. And you got to think him be his presence out there helps the team at least a little bit because you know teams have to at least be aware. But if it gets to a point where they know he's just not the same player and they're watching him on film and they're like, eh. And if he and also like he only played, uh, I want to say it was fifty eight percent of the snaps this weekend. Like that's very uncharacteristic for Miles Garrett. Like he just a little over half of the the plays he played on defense. Like if if that's what you're going to get from Miles Garrett, I get that he can make a, he can get you a sack on any play. But yeah, like that's that's not that's again, where at what point is it hurting the team more than helping the team? And that's something that they're going to have to kind of weigh and and navigate here. But I am anticipating at some point that he probably ends up 
um, having to deal with, miss some time with that injury, even if it's just to let it heal for a little bit. Eric, I, I want to talk about a specific. Well, and and we do need to get into probably a little bit do like the the the. Well, let's do that first. Actually, the game this game flipped, man, on the interception that wasn't because of the Greg Newsom roughing the passer, and it's crazy because. You go from maybe being up 14 nothing to then all of a sudden they do get this this great drive together and go down the field. Now, what I'll say about the defense is like after that moment, they they unraveled in the first half, but they did find a way to sort of stop the bleeding and responded in the second half. Um, are you concerned with that group at this point on the defensive side of the ball? Um, because they they're just not able to, you know, limit the damage maybe as well as they did last year. And or are you or do you think that that group is 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 okay and it's it's you know you're you're more so looking at the offense as the as the problem right now i i think that i think they'll be okay i think the teams have schemed well against them uh, i think when it's all said and done what i really believe about this past game is that the browns thought they were just going to show up and win yeah just just looking at how they they're moving around and the, the, how they acted on that field. I just thought they they felt like they were, both coaches and players. I thought it was going to be a situation where they thought there was going to be a situation where no matter what we called, it was going to work. Defensively, we count on we can count on uh, quarterback to be himself and just throw the ball to us. Daniel Jones would be himself and throw the ball to us. It's just those things. Even though we know he can run the ball, which he did a lot. Of. And yeah. so I, I I think they made it harder on themselves than they had to be. And so I'm not really worried about this group. I think uh, Schwartz get them locked in. They know they got a tough stretch. They know they're in a situation where they have to win games because because Pittsburgh is trying to stretch out the lead in the division out. So they have to win these games. So they better be locked in right now. And, I, and so I'm not worried about them. I think these guys are professionals and they'll take care of their business. What did you think about the fourth down decision by Kevin Stefanski going forward on fourth and one? with about four or there's a little over four minutes to go in, in regulation. I was sitting up in the press box and I was like, he's got to punt this here. Like, and I understand like it's an analytic driven league, the going for two when he did actually, when you do the math on it and you look at the, 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 what the analytics say, they say it's advantageous to you. And I kind of understood that because it was like, okay, if you get the two, you're all, you, you don't necessarily have to chase a touchdown. You can maybe get the ball back, kick a field goal and you get a second chance to kick a field goal. So that one I'm fine with, but the fourth down, it was perplexing that he went forward in that spot because again, if you give the ball back to the giants there and they, I mean, they got lucky because the giants missed a field goal after that, but they theoretically would have ended the game on that next series. If, if they don't miss a field goal. Well, well, Eric Metcalf, the player, and if I were coach <laughs> would, would have punted it, but Eric Metcalf, the guy who watches the Browns is not shocked at all. Cause this is what we have seen since he's been the, the head coach. Yeah. And so, with that in mind, everyone in the stands should not be shocked. Everybody wasn't. Everybody should expect this. We just expect now that if they're going to go for it, that we're going to dial up a play that gives us a chance of getting it. Because we, yeah. because the, because what we ran was clearly not the play, and everybody was waiting for that on the, on the Giants' side of the ball. We're just going to put Jameson and, and go for it, right? And that's. <laughs> I mean, and, and we're not the, the, the Philly yeah. tush push. <laughs> it hasn't been like that. And so yeah. I, I think if you're going to do it, I think you give yourself more options. You know, I think you, you do something with maybe a Deshaun rolling out and uh, somebody in the flat, run past uh, option. You have to give yourself options. And we, and we didn't do that. And we didn't get it. And it almost cost us. It, eventually we had a chance, like you said, but we, we really needed something back then, right then. Yeah, that was a tough one, man. And I'm with you. Like uh, Spencer German, the coach, is is punting there. I think um, just I, I and I, I part of it too. And this is part of my problem. I I I want to be clear because I think Kevin Spansky is a really really good coach. I think he was worthy of the the extension he got. He's clearly turned around the franchise. All these things. But my one gripe with him tends to be sometimes like I think he has a hard time balancing like the analytics, which are important to football, with feel of the game. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, there's got to be sort of like understanding where your team, where your team is at, how they're playing. And then that moment, like you got four minutes left. Defense has pitched a shutout in the second half. I get they were bad in the first half, but they pitched a shutout in the second half. Give them a chance to get you one more stop. And then you set yourself up potentially, maybe with even better field position to try to go down and, and get yourself a game winning score. I don't know. I, I just think sometimes he struggles with that. And I feel like that was another one of those moments. 
See, we've come to the point where everybody should realize that even before the last few years, analytics has been in football. Yeah, It's always yeah. been in football, but now it's come to the forefront. And so everything, everybody thinks analytically. Everybody thinks it's about the numbers. Unfortunately, when you go straight analytics, it takes out the human element, right? We we might be able to get this uh, fourth and, and one or two, but we can't account for is the offensive line hurt, tired? Are those guys hurt or tired? What have you? So who's going to play harder than the other on a particular play? And so the, that doesn't count, account for that. And so it makes it hard. You just have to dial up what you feel is best as for your team. Are we can, are we run pass oriented better? Or are we just straight hand the ball off and run smash mouth football? And so in, in that situation, we went quarterback sneak, and we felt we were better, but the Giants didn't. Eric, uh, I know we've, we've, had, we've had a great episode breaking down this Giants game. I do want to pivot a little bit and look ahead to the Raiders game because I'll, I'll say this, man. Like, we thought the Giants game was – was I don't, I don't want to call it a gimme because these games are hard to win in football in, in the NFL. We know this. But this felt like one that the Browns should win because they're the better team. That Washington game in a couple weeks was very similar. It was like they should win this game because they're the better team. And I think this Raiders game sort of falls in that boat as well. But given how this team is playing right now – I don't know that we can call any of these games like obvious wins for the Browns because they're they're all going to be tough, it seems. How much is this game? I know it's only week four, but how much does this game feel like it's it's a must-win situation for the Browns to kind of get the season on track, especially against an AFC opponent? To me, it's a must-win. Regardless of it being in week four, I mean, because it could be one and three is way uglier than two and two. Yeah. And and it, and depending on what I said, like what Pittsburgh does this coming week, it could be even uglier, right? And so if you want to give yourself a chance, you have to win this game. Fortunately, we're we're playing the Raiders, who haven't been playing good football either. And so you know when you got their their head coach and talking about some, they watched the film, they watched the game. Some guys were making business decisions, and they will make business decisions also. You know they're in in a little disarray as well, and so. I think this is a situation where, on paper, player man for man, we're the better team. So we need to go and take advantage of that. Steelers, by the way, play the Colts this weekend as they look to improve to 4-0. and Like Eric mentioned, they've kind of built some separation in the division. We know the Bengals and Ravens off to, to not great starts. Ravens got their first win this weekend. Bengals 0-3. But this division, when they all face each other head-to-head, it ends up being tough games. And those, are, those games are looming coming up in October. I agree with you, though, man. Like, this one's big because, especially it's because it's an AFC opponent, tiebreakers and things at the end of the season. It, the Raiders obviously already beat the Ravens, so if you're if you if you're able to get things on track here and you have that win over them, like this could come into play later down the line. You can't lose this game. It's it's a massive one for the Browns in this opening stretch of the season, guys. We appreciate you tuning in as always to the Dog Check Podcast, part of the Believe Network Podcast, also airing weekly on Bally Sports Cleveland. I want to remind you guys. This week we are going. I'm going to do my first mailbag show with you guys. Dogcheck216 at gmail.com is where you can send your questions from the fans. We want it to be a very fan-driven show. We'll do some fun stuff. I'm going to make some picks for the weekend. Do some different things like that. Uh, but please send your emails and your questions to dogcheck216 at gmail.com, and uh, I will respond to you guys here later in the week. Eric, always appreciate this conversation, man. I know we went a lot longer than usual, but that was because there was a lot to talk about. And uh, hopefully we're talking about a win next week. Yeah, we will. We will be. Go Browns. I like that. I like the confidence. Even after all the negative we talked about today, Eric still got the confidence. I love it. All right, guys. Appreciate you as always. And go Browns. 